how could so many sincere people read the same Bible text, each consider the same text to be holy, inspired by the Most High? And many consider themselves faithful, like myself, and I'm sure you out there who's hearing this, to the same exact word. But, of course, not those who disagree with us, right? <laughs> well, we try to stay humble and, and try not to cause division or upsets with the people we love. But how could this be? Really, when you think about it, why so many different interpretations of the same holy text that's been inspired? So the title of this teaching is Multiple Choice Interpretations. Well, some of you out there, well, most of you out there, right, have, have some academic background, and you've had multiple choice tests, A, B, C, D, or all of the above. Well, when it comes to the Bible, the Holy Bible, why are there so many possible, logical, interpretations, yet come to so many different conclusions. It's almost like uh, looking at a chart sometimes. Well, this word can be interpreted this way, A, B, C, D, or is it all of the above? Well, to answer that question, why, I'd like to always remind that we may always remember Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2, where it says, It is the glory of Elohim to conceal a matter, or it can mean to hide the truth. But it is the glory of kings, of royalty. May I plug that word in there, a synonymous word? Is to search out the matter. And there's more than one matter to search out in our life, so we could say matters. And in this, especially with things that do matter. Well, there's another word that has more than one meaning, matter. Well, yes, he, there's so much in the scriptures, and, and we need to search the scriptures, search out matters, try to understand better the different ways words can be interpreted going from one language to another. And as kids, we just love hide and seek, right? We, we like hide and seek, and so do adults. Uh, there's treasure hunts in the cities. If you go to a big city, you could do these treasure hunts. Big tech companies like to have off-sites where they go do treasure hunts. So you get out in the wilderness and get the compass out and have some treasure hunts go from point A, point B, and there's competitions. And, and we like to search for things. And the harder it is to get to something, and we, if we can obtain it, that is, we tend to appreciate it more the harder we work. And this is why... The Most High, he has realized uh, it, it's important to hide things and not just make it as simple and plain as everyone would like sometimes. Yes, he intentionally hides, withholds, disperses, scatters, and or even buries explicit information that we would just love to have. And isn't there a scripture in Second Thessalonians there where it says that he even sends a strong delusion to those who do not love the truth. And well, let me throw that word enough in there because we've we got to love the truth enough. Everyone claims to love the truth and, and what is truth. And the truth will set us free. Yet, there's still difficulty in finding the truth and knowing what the truth is on this matter or that matter. And as we see in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 13, it says, But the word of, and here's that holy name, that yud heh vav -Hey. Many of us say Yahweh and, or Yahuwah and other ways to pronounce it. But the word of Yah, the Lord, as it says in the English translation, was to them precept upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, again. 
here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backwards. Now, wait a second. I thought everyone was supposed to be saved. Well, yeah, he wants everyone to be saved. But reading that in the context, he's talking about the stubborn and stiff-necked ones. And, and he says in that, and be broken and snared and caught. And, and these are people who just don't want to follow his ways, no matter how much he tries to win people over. I see some comments. Let's take a little break to check them out. Make sure there's no questions. Okay, you know, someone said to move on to the next one. Okay, let's move on. Thank you for the comment out there. So which interpretation, interpretations create whole, I put there like some people say whole wheat, whole Bible, perfect unity versus obvious contradictions? How do we determine that? How do we decipher perfect unity, what creates perfect unity within the whole script, word of well, yes, there's multiple choice interpretations, but how? How do we do this? Well, there's literal and figurative duality. You can say duality if it's both literal and figurative. And some prophecies are, have duality to it, and sometimes there's more than just dual. There's more than two interpretations that can be accurate. There's parables, allegories, metaphors, mysteries, hidden meanings as we saw in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. There's homonyms and homophones. Homophones are types of homonyms. What are they? How about homographs? In every single language, whether it be Hebrew, Biblical Hebrew, Ancient Greek, English, every language has homonyms, homographs, he heteronyms, which are types of homographs. So again, which interpretation of each creates, and this is where we have differences of opinion, and a lot of times this is what I'll express to someone if I'm in a debate and we're in a disagreement, and I'll say, well, yeah, if you want to interpret under the law as meaning you don't have to obey God, that creates serious contradictions, obvious contradictions with many scriptures. Right? I'm going to choose the interpretation and the understanding of, of the text that creates perfect unity if there's a logical possible way to interpret. I'm not saying we just make it up out of thin air and just try to pretend uh, that it means something that we want it to mean. I'm not saying that, of course, but like I said, there's different ways to interpret words. So talking about, and I don't want you to get homophobic out there, too homophobic. I'm not talking about all these different types of homos out there, but homo, homonyms, homophones, homographs, and heteronyms. What are they? before I dive into this topic. Well, a homonym, in case anyone out there doesn't know, are words with the same sound, but same or different spelling. A homophone is a type of homonym. It has the same sound, but a different spelling. A homograph has the same spelling with the same or a different sound. I'll give you some examples, so it'll get a little confusing if I don't. A heteronym. This is a type of homograph. It's the same spelling, any word with the same spelling but a different sound. How about some English examples? I'll give you some English examples before we get to some Greek and some Hebrew from the scriptures. Like the word fair, F-A-I-R, or fair, F-A-I-R. It could mean, okay, are you being reasonable or are we talking about like a county fair? Right? That's a homonym. It's the same sound, but it's also a homograph. It has the same exact spelling. This is where, like I said, multiple choice. A, B, C. How are we going to interpret this word? How are we going to understand the context more accurately? Here's another one. Pear. It could be a fruit. Right? P-E-A-R or P-A-I-R, like a, a couple. You know, they're, they're a cute pair of birds or people or whatever. So those two different words for pair is a, is a homonym, the same sound, but it's also a homophone. It has the same sound, but a different spelling. And we see a lot of this in the scriptures too. Uh, here's the word lie, 
All right, lie or lie, L-I-E. Now there's also an L-Y-E, but here's L-I-E can mean an untruth, if I may word it that way, or to lie down. And sometimes I like to be sarcastic with my friends and, and sometimes they don't like that and I'll say, oh, now quit lying, Russell. And they'll say, I'm not lying. I'm standing, okay? I'm, or I'm sitting right now. I'm not, I'm not lying. I'm, you know, trying to be sarcastic. I'm hoping, you know, and I'm just joking around. I'm not trying to deceive you. Please don't take it that way. And so forth. And, but that is a homonym. It's got the same sound. And it's also a homograph, the same exact spelling. And that's where it gets, it can get kind of difficult when we're trying to understand certain text. The word tear or tear can be spelled exactly the same way, different vowels. We've got T-E-A-R or T-E-A-R, uh, like a tear from your eyes, that's spelled T-E-A-R, but there's also a rip, like if you tear something, uh, te he tore that piece of paper. Is it okay if I tear this piece of paper? That's T, same exact spelling, T-E-A-R, and that's a homograph with the same spelling and a hetero Nim, different sound, completely different sound. So how can we know which is the true definition in every case, especially when it comes to the original biblical languages, ancient Hebrew and also Greek? If, you know, even if we're in the Tanakh, we, we've got the Septuagint to consider in certain matters and comparing that with uh, the Brit Hadashah writings, the, the New Covenant, New Testament. AKA context. Of course, everyone says context is important, but also culture. There's cultural idioms. There's there's grammar. Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it an adjective? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And also, I put notice the highlight there. HS, the Holy Spirit or Ruach Hakodesh. Consider Aramaic. Oh yeah. And then there's also a great comment from a, a brother or sister out there. I don't know who that is. He's got his Hebrew there, so that's great. Uh, Aramaic is, yeah, is it Aramaic? This is a, there's biblical Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, and Aramaic was, it came from the Hebrew. It was more, people say, is the poor Hebrews language of the ancient times, uh, the less educated ones, the uh, the ones that were living in, like in Galilee and, and the areas that weren't in the high and mighty leadership in, in Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, great comment. Now, how about a biblical Greek New Testament example? Okay, that's, finally, Russ, you're getting to it, all right? Sometimes it takes me a while to get to my points and... And I like to build up a little bit and appreciate your patience with me out there. Okay, there's, here's an, a good example of what we're talking about. The word sabaton, the Greek, the strongest concordance number is 4521. Unless I got a typo in there, I believe that's 20, I double checked that. It can mean a Sabbath or it can mean week. It's, a, it's an interchangeable word, believe it or not. And with the context, you can go through a lot, all, there's a lot more examples. I'm going to give you three good examples here is where it says, for example, in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, this is where mainstream Christianity says, oh, well, look, it says here, now on the first of the week, that's the word miaton, it says, and then sabaton, when the disciples came together to break bread. And say, oh, well, see, the Sabbath was the first day of the week. Well, that, that is a possible interpretation. You could say first of the Sabbath, or Sabbath, which could also be referring to counting seven Sabbaths in, in Shavuot, or they say Pentecost, counting 50 in Hebrew. This becomes more of an ambiguous scripture to try to prove that the, the Sabbath is moving to a Sunday. And, and, and secondly, in Judaism, they break bread every day. Every formal meal, they break bread and do a blessing, right? They go, Baruka ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Hamotze Lachem Min Haaretz, and that's the traditional breaking of bread blessing. 
And you can throw your heart and your own words in there too. I don't think there's it's a sin or wrong to do that. I like to do it too myself. Um, just pray right from the heart. Now also let's move on to the same Greek word in a parable where our Messiah said, I and he's talking about the Pharisees who were keeping Torah. Notice this. He's trying to talking about this, this righteous, this Pharisee who's a Torah-observant Pharisee praying, I fast twice a week. Now, I don't think anyone would say I, I, fast, I fast twice a Sabbath. In fact, Jewish people don't fast on the Sabbath. They, you know, it's a day of feasting and blessings, and you wouldn't want to fast on a Sabbath unless it's really serious, and, and uh, like a very serious matter, very unusual circumstances to, to fast on a weekly Sabbath or even an annual Sabbath other than of course Yom Kippur where we fast but fasting twice a week here we can see this word is the proper interpretation would most people would say yeah week is correct he says I give tithes to all that I possess well it could be money okay money's not a sin all like Jacob said I'm gonna I'm gonna tithe on everything right uh, some people just don't want to tithe on anything and, and mainstream Christianity says if you don't keep the Torah well why do they teach tithing and then a lot of people come start keeping Torah but they don't want to tithe of course and they say it's just agricultural and well anyway I don't want to get off on another topic another tangent here our Messiah Yeshua he's pointing out that here's this person praying boasting about how Torah observant they are on tithing on everything and you know, fasting twice a week. And that's in Luke chapter 18, verse 12. Notice also our Messiah, as he commanded in Matthew chapter 24, verse 20, says, And pray that your flight may not be in winter. Obvious. We don't want to be traveling in the cold and, and running for our lives and having to hide out here or there and not sure where we're going to go next and where, what we're going to eat next. And uh, the winter's harder. And also on the Sabbath, Sabbath tone. That word there, most of us would not say, okay, pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on a week, or on the week, or during the week, or on a, on a weekday. Uh, I think we can all see that Sabbath is the proper interpretation there, even though it's an interchangeable word. Yes, the context and what is applying, sometimes it takes just a little bit of logic, and other times not so. I see some comments, so I'll go check those out. Someone says that Sabbaton is not Greek. Yeah, there is a Shabbaton. Let's let's take a look here. Did I did I do it? I know Shabbat Shabbaton is referred. I'll get to that a little bit later. Let me back up here. Ryan's got a comment. Yeah, we're gonna get to that. We're gonna see how the word week is interchangeable with seven. We're gonna get into a lot of this stuff here. And yeah, my pronunciation may not be that great, but uh, let me just go grab my strong concordance real quick. Oh, it's right here. If anyone wants to share a screen, let me know because I can always share the screen. I know Pat's got some really cool concordances on there. I'm kind of still old school and using my concordance. Strong concordance 4521. Yeah, the transliteration, I was correct. Wait, yeah, is Sabaton. They don't pronounce it with the sh with the, S the shin, like the S-H, like in Hebrew. But it's very similar to Shabbaton. We'll get to that with the, with the annual, what some people call annual Sabbath. Yeah, I did write that correct up there. You can check up on your own Strong's Concordance or dig out your own Greek Concordance, whichever one you prefer. Okay, moving on to the next slide. How about a Biblical Hebrew Torah example? I just used the Greek example of the word Sabbaton. Okay, the word Shabbat, the Shin, the Bet, and the Tav. And... And of course, there were no vowels 2,000 plus years ago. 
Now we're going to look at some scriptures here, seeing how Sabbath and in Orthodox Judaism and the Pharisaic, the, the Pharisees 2,000 years ago looked at cycles of seven, and it could be viewed and in interchangeable with days or weeks or even years. Like in Leviticus. You see in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 8. And you shall count seven. That's uh, Shavua. Hebrew, the Shin, the Vet, the Ayan. Some people say Shavua. The, the Strongs will use a, a B. Think that it's a B, but you know I, I don't really trust the Strongs too much pronunciations. But Shavua Sabbath or however you like to pronounce that. Again, and there were no vowels, and, and it's kind of like trying to debate about the holy name. Okay, We can debate about the, the vowels and how to pronounce it. The word Sabbath there has the tav suffix. I put the shin tav and the bet shabbatot, but it's still given the same strongs number, which is the 7676 strongs. And it's talking about Sabbath of years, not days, but years. For yourself, seven. Here's that word, uh, Shavua, times. Seven times seven years. This is the Jubilee. This is getting to the 50th year, of course. In each seven years, they what they call the Shemitah years. And the time of the seven, Sabbaths, let's kind of put that in for emphasis there, and I'm highlighting that so it's easier for the eye to pick up on. You know, four times we see the words years in there. Four times we see the word seven. Uh, so they see the word Sabbath, Shabbat, is not limited, let me word it this way, not limited to weekly Sabbath days only. It's not the limitation of that word. Getting to back to Leviticus 23.15, this becomes more debatable even 2,000 years ago. It says, and you shall count for yourselves from the day... The Yom, after the Sabbath, that's HaShabbat, it's got the hay before it, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave sheaf, wave offering. Seven, there's that word Shavua. Sheva is the way you'd pronounce the word seven, actually, Sheva. Shavua is what's the same word that's used for week. Now, not modern Hebrew, we'll get into a little bit of modern Hebrew versus biblical Hebrew, so uh, be patient with me. Uh, but we see seven Sabbaths, and there the word, notice how Sabbaths, we'll get into this a little bit later, you got the shin, the bet, and the tav, and then you have the vav and the tav suffix. And what's interesting is whenever it's, whenever it's re referring to the annual rest days, it, it will have, um, I believe, the vav and the noon, Shabbaton. But here, anyway, we'll get to that a little bit later. This is the Shabbatot shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. So let's continue here. And this is where the Pharisees and the Sadducees, among the, those two big camps 2,000 years ago. Now, before I get to that, let me get caught up in the comments over here. Getting a lot of comments today. Shabbat is weekly. Uh, our commander says out there, Shabbat Shabbaton is yearly or annual. Yes, we'll get to that. Shabbaton is Shabbaton from Hebrew, and the Greek is very similar. And thank you for putting the Hebrew there. Yep, I'll get to that as well, Shabbaton. The Shin, the Bet, the Tav, the Vav, which is a vowel. We say O. They put the O on the top there, not U. Um, and then the noon suffix. Yeah, thank you for your comments. We've got a, someone who knows their Hebrew out there. I'd like to see that. Uh, it says here, Patrick says, uh, book, book of Hebrew mentions there remains of rest. Okay, I don't want to jump off on uh, too many topics. Let's get, let's get back to here. Get back to this, you guys. Good comments out there. Now, there was disagreement 2,000 years ago regarding the counting of Shavuot. Or as we say in Greek, Pentecost. Pentecost means counting 50. Was it counting seven weeks or versus counting seven Sabbaths? The Pharisees 
uh, and Orthodox Judaism, they are the successors of the Pharisees today, and claim that it's seven weeks. As we'll look at their translations, and and others will say seven Sabbaths. Notice in Leviticus, getting back to this is where there's some debate. There's been a lot of debate over the centuries between native Hebrew speakers. We got to realize that these aren't English native speakers or any other language. These are native Hebrew speakers. Two thousand years ago, biblical Hebrew was their native tongue, and they still had disagreements within the Sanhedrin, the leadership of the Second Temple. So this is where the debate starts on this topic. In verse 11, it says, And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, that's Yah, the Holy One, the Most High, to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And so this has been the debate. Okay, is it, a, is it an annual or a yearly Sabbath, as our commenter make it? Annual or yearly, once a year Sabbath? Or is it a weekly Sabbath? that the priest shall wave it. Leviticus 23. Well, okay. What does the day after annual Sabbath, can it be any day of the week versus, of course, the weekly Sabbath? That would mean it was always on Sunday. If you were to count the Omer as you continue in Leviticus 23, 50 days, if, if it's the day after a weekly Sabbath, then, of course, it would always be on a Sunday as the Sadducees believed and practiced. And the Karaites claim to be the successors, and they still do that to this day today. And Orthodox Judaism disagrees and, and does it from the annual Sabbath, the first day of Matzot, uh, or Matzah if you're talking singular, uh, the, then bread, bread without leavening. Okay, now Pharisees, like I said, in Orthodox Judaism that had claimed that the Sabbath was interchangeable. This is what they claim today that the word Sabbath, Shabbat, the Shin, the Bet, and the Tav, was interchangeable with week or Sabbath during ancient times. And then I put BH, that's my abbreviation for Biblical Hebrew. And I'm not the only one who does that. I'm not the one who started that. I don't claim that. But I, I, you know, I noticed that little abbreviation for those of you out there who may not know. Is it interchangeable? How do they come up with that? Well, going back to the Shemitah years, the counting seven weeks and seven Sabbaths, a, a cycle of seven. A week is a cycle of seven. Uh, counting the Omer are cycles of seven. And, and this is where the debate rises, you know, a long, long time ago. Therefore, Shavuot, or Pentecost, the 50th day can be on any day of the week is what's claimed, depending on when the first day of, uh, of unleavened. And of course, there's been some postponement rules that have been added, that Judaism added centuries after the destruction of the temple, so it, it won't land on any day of the week these days. Uh, but back in those days, there were no postponement rules, and I can show that through even the Talmud, um, that there was no, or not the Talmud, but the Mishnah, you know, the early writings that there was no postponement rules in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. Uh, anyway, I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent. But the Sadducees and the Karaites have taken the opposite interpretation, as I've mentioned, so that Shavuot, uh, Pentecost, the 50th day, must always be on a Sunday. So annual Sabbath, this is where our commenter put it in the Hebrew. You have the Shin, the Tav, and the... You know, the Shin, the Bet, and the Tav, Shabbat, and then the Vav, and I'm not throwing in vowels in there because they didn't exist a long time ago, but we'd say Shabbaton, Shabbaton, however you want to pronounce the vowels, versus weekly Sabbath, that would be Shabbat. Now, so getting, notice in Leviticus here, this is hmm, different from what my screen usually shows. Leviticus chapter... 16 verse 31, for on the day that the priest shall make atonement, this is talking about Yom Kippur, for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Most High. Verse 31, it is a Sabbath, a Shabbat of solemn rest. And then it also, where it says rest there, that's the word Shabbaton. I've noticed and many people have noticed, and, and I've heard this before, 
from others, not just myself, that the that Shabbaton is always in ap application to the annual Sabbath, and, and so far I have not seen it applied to a weekly Sabbath. There's different suffix letters for, to the weekly Sabbath, like the, the plural suffix, as I pointed out earlier, the Shabbatot. But here we have Shabbaton applied also Shabbat, because when you go to Leviticus 23, you see that there that there's more restrictions on the fast day Sabbath because it's more comparable to a weekly Sabbath, where on the other, the annual Shabbatones, it says no customary work. And on the weekly Shabbats, it says no work. And on So there's a little bit of different terminology, and it's even translated a little bit differently into the English, so that you don't have to be a, a Hebrew expert or scholar to know that. Just look at how carefully... It's worded differently. Here's another example in Leviticus 23, 24. Speak to the house of Israel, Israel, and saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, this is our Yom Teruah, holy day, annual holy day, you shall have a Sabbath rest, is, is the King James Version. That's the Shabbaton. And the, the Strong's Concordance is very close. So 7676 is Shabbat. But 7677 is the is the strong concordance for Shabbaton. A memorial of blowing shofars, a holy convocation, a mikra kodesh. It shall be to you a Sabbath, a solemn rest. Here, getting back to Yom Kippur, calling it a Sabbath, a Shabbat, and a Shabbaton. And you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening. And while you know that's another word that can be translated different ways, as being afternoon or or before sunset, it can also apply to shortly after sunset. There's twilight and even, and, and a lot of different different ways to interpret that Hebrew word. And that, I'm not going to go off on there, but that's just another example. And some people wanting to starting their Sabbaths with sunrise instead of sunsets. Uh, a lot of misunderstandings from the Hebrew. And this is why people are coming to such big different conclusions. And like I said, what creates perfect unity throughout the whole Holy Bible, that's the interpretation I take. And until I can see that I'm taking a wrong conclusion that creates a serious contradiction somewhere else in the Scriptures, I need to be able to unify and create perfect unity in all the scriptures. So let's let's look at logical, explicit conclusions. And if you can't stick around with me until I'm done with this, I'm going to record it. It's going to be edited. I'll be able to cut out little things that I don't want in there, and then I'll upload it maybe sometime during the week, whenever I can get around to it. It usually takes me about six to ten hours going through word for word and I like to splice and dice and jazz it up with text and, and improve it with whatever other images I can insert and improve the video to make it as user-friendly and, and as easy for people to learn who don't know even the basics out there. Uh, people who are listening to me now are, know a lot more than the basics, so, but I'll improve it for the YouTube upload later. And I always love to hear testimonies on how people find me online, was it Facebook or just finding me on YouTube. They don't have to give that to me now, but you know, I'm always curious. I like to hear how people hear about me. Anyway, let's look at some logical, explicit conclusions that we can have, that we can draw to from what we've seen so far, what I've presented so far in this whole uh, when do we start counting the Omer and, and the day after the Sabbath and and, and is it a weekly Sabbath, annual Sabbath, uh, Shabbaton, or Shabbat? Well, so far we can see that annual Sabbaths never explicitly listed in the Torah as Shabbat alone. Notice I put the word highlighted there, alone. It's, it's always included with the, the Vav and the Noon suffix, Shabbaton. And if you find one that, that proves me wrong, then like I said, shoot it off to me and let me have it. I, I like to admit when I'm wrong, when the evidence and the proof is in the pudding. As iron sharpened and iron, we can learn from each other. Uh, next point is annual Sabbaths are always listed as 
Shabbaton, within explicit context. I'm talking about explicit, and there's a lot of words where you, if you just do a word for Sabbath in English, say in your word search, you're going to find a lot of scriptures with Sabbath, and sometimes it's like, well, yeah, is it talking about the annual one? Is it talking about the, the weekly one? A lot of times there's not enough in the context to, to really say, yeah, here's perfect proof in the pudding to prove the other guys out there wrong and that I'm right, but I've chosen some ones uh, just to kind of make some points here, and then we're going to progress as we go to try to understand this more accurately. There's weekly Sabbaths. They may contain other suffix letters. Yes, we can see other suffix letters when it comes to weekly Sabbaths, but so far I have never seen a Vav and a Noon suffix as applied to a weekly Shabbat. Usually it's always in the context or applying to annual ones, weekly ones. And I think that's important to realize. It becomes better evidence to try to determine when to start counting the Omer, I think. I mean, it's not as, as explicit as some people would like. And, and languages change over time, and I'm going to point that out as well later on in this video teaching, that, that words and languages do change over, over centuries slightly. And so just because somebody knows modern Hebrew, for example, doesn't mean that they understand biblical Hebrew. And I'll give you a good example of that later. So with all that in mind, let's revisit Leviticus. All right? Vaikra 23.11. He shall wave the sheaf before the Most High to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the HaShabbat. Notice it doesn't say Shabbaton. If it, if it said Shabbaton, then it would be explicit evidence for the Pharisees and, and modern Judaism. Orthodox Judaism, I should say, because the Karaites, of course, don't take it the same way. It's not explicit, so let's continue here. Another comment before... Why does Yeshua command us to pray that our flight is not on the Sabbath? Yeah, that is a good question, Ryan. Well, notice how he points out in Matthew 24, 20, same verse, he points out the winter. We don't have control over the winter. We have no authority or power or control to change the winter. So he uses something obvious to point out something that's not so obvious to people. People always want to forget the Shabbat. Right? That's the only one of the ten he says, remember. He doesn't have to say remember to the other nine. And all of Christianity agrees with the other nine in, in their interpretation of it. But that one, fourth one, is Jewish somehow. And even though it existed be two and a half thousand years before the Jews existed, it, it goes back to creation week. Anyway, this is a little brief answer to your question there. Let's continue on here. I've got a good comment from our... Hebrew out there, he says, this is not like anything you have seen even in Messianic circles. Uh, I hope that's a compliment. <laughs> I think it's a compliment. Uh, thank you out there. Tada Rabbah, may I say. Oh. Okay. Yeah, oh, you weren't applying to us. You're okay. Your, your comment. Okay, I'll, I'll have a Q&A at the end. We can get to more detailed stuff later on. Uh, anyway, so notice that the Shabbaton would be explicit for first annual Sabbath, like I said, if we're talking in Vayikra 2311, Leviticus 2311. But, you know, it's not in there. Like I said, it's not in there. It would be nice if it was. It would really put the nail in on the coffin, if I may use that idiom. It's an idiom. Don't take it literally, please. I don't have any axe to grind against uh, anybody who's Jewish or not Jewish. Okay, so Pharisees, they claimed that it's referring to weeks, that, that Shabbat can be referring to weeks, not Sabbaths, when they're getting down to Leviticus 23, verse 15 and 16. And notice here it says, from the day after the rest, this is uh, the complete Jewish Bible, and by the way, Messianic Judaism uh, kind of sides with modern Judaism on this topic, of course, and so uh, 
Uh, David Stern and his interpretation of this is, is very is what you'll see when you take out any Tanakh from Orthodox Judaism today. And, but that word is Hashabbat, not Shabbaton. From the day after the day of rest is the way it's translated here. That is, from the day you bring the sheaf for waiting, you are to count seven full weeks. Now that's Shabbatot, not Shabbaton. It's got a Tav at the end, not a noon Safit. All right? And then there's the Shavua, Sheva. You know, Sheva. And I could throw some bells in there to make it a Shavu if I wanted to, right? But we've got to be accurate here to, to try to decipher. And I'm going to show you some scriptures where week is, is, does not have the Vav in there. It's, it's simply the Shin, the Vet, and the Ayin. Nevertheless, until the day after the seventh week, here it again, HaShabbat HaShabbayot. Uh, a lot of L's in there, different ways to pronounce that, of course, but it's not what we're looking for to, to make it look like you're counting seven weeks or to the seventh week. That's uh, the suffix, or the seventh. Uh, it's the grammar, Hebrew grammar for seventh, instead of just saying seven. It says, you are to count 50 days, in dot, dot, dot. You can continue on that if you want, but not so applicable to what I'm talking about. So, could the day after the seventh week be any day of the week, or the day after the seventh Sabbath is always on a Sunday? That's, again, as a reminder of the debate that's going on with this text. Even 2,000 years ago, as with the ancient Greek language, uh, could week and Sabbath have been interchangeable as, as, as with the Greek? Coming from Shabbat, because we could see that in the Greek that it's interchangeable, and it's pretty explicit when we look at just the New Testament itself. You know, this is what the Pharisees and Orthodox Judaism have claimed for the last couple thousand years, is that it is interchangeable. And, and they'll come up with some really good arguments with everything I've presented so far to, to debunk the conclusion that Shavuot... Pentecost should always be on a Sunday. And so I'm going to have to continue on here. There's a little more investigation here with some words. Uh, Sadducees and uh, Karaites, who claim to be modern, they're like successors since the 8th, 9th century, they started calling themselves Karaites. Karaite is a Hebrew for like scripture alone. And there's other translations. Uh, the, the Christian translations have sided with the Sadducees on the interpretations for some of the reasons I've just express and perhaps some more I have to express here. Getting back to Leviticus, quoting this again from more of a translation that, that most in the Hebrew roots and any kind of movement of Christians coming to Torah, other than Messianic Judaism, again, like I said, is usually taking the side of the Pharisees in, this, in the modern Judaism. But getting back to here, it says, and you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths. Again, like I pointed out, the Shabbatot, Sheva, or Sheva, Shabbatot, depending on the order that you want. You know, in, in Spanish, you notice how the adjectives are, are before the noun, or after the nouns, like you say car blue instead of blue car. English, you would put it before the noun. And so, understanding grammar as you're reading the text is, is important, and you've got to match things up. And I'll show you how there's a good online. I like to go to the scriptures, the Tanakh, free online, to, to look at and double check up on these things, to, to even see the English words right underneath. For those out there who are not experts in Hebrew or scholars, but we see that Shavuot, or Pentecost is always on a Sunday, the 50th day, the way the interpretation. When you look at it the way it's interpreted this way, that's the only real logical conclusion you'd come to. So which interpretation creates, like I said, whole, whole, holy Bible? Perfect unity rather than obvious contradictions? Well, here I have exposed for you a snapshot that I've also been doctoring up and editing. This, this is from the scriptureforall.org. You can just Google search 
Tanakh, online, free, interlinear, any of those type of words. But we're going to see here, going back to Leviticus 25, why Orthodox Judaism will take this view that we can count seven weeks instead of seven Sabbaths, and you can translate it as weeks instead of Sabbaths, is because seven or Shabbat is simply referring to cycles of seven, whether we're talking about days or years, that it's interchangeable. Because in here you can see it is the Shin, the Bet, no, no, actually I'm in the wrong spot, right there. It's the Shin, Bet, Tav, Double Tav here, plural, for Shabbatot, Sabbath. And it's mentioned two times in this context. And notice how years is mentioned four times. And then days is thrown in there, too. This is where they start saying, okay, well, it can also be interchangeable. We, we've got yomi. Uh, that's the, the yud suffix in regard to the grammar of the context there is the yomim. Sometimes there's a, a mem, a, a yud and a mem suffix. When you see, like when Joseph was in prison, it says he was in prison with you know, the two guys there, the, the butler and the baker for a yomim. That doesn't mean a day, it's it's a number of days and and so there can be plurality to Yom. Yom is the Hebrew word for day, singular. Nevertheless, this is like I said, Leviticus twenty five, eight, two times Sabbath, four times seven, four times we see years, and one time we see days. So how about weeks? Is it interchangeable then? Can we see the word days in there? And over here in the right you can see the English translation that's been put into that. Now, before I go on to the next slide, let me see what our comments, if there's anything. All right, if you're a Karaite out there, uh, please forgive me if I mispronounced your, uh, your type of Judaism. I'm not a big sacred namer. I don't like split P's over, over vowels that didn't, weren't in the text 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Uh, to forgive me, I'm not as expert as some people out there in their vowel pronunciations, and I'm not as dogmatic, I should say, either. But here's some modern Hebrew. You can go on to Google Translate with any Gmail, and you can see that seven is over here. It's Sheva, is the way it's usually pronounced, just the Shin, the Tav, and the Ayin. Over here we have, okay, if you type in week, it gives you the Vav in there. I'm going to show you in scripture where you're not going to see that little, it looks like a, a, a capital I, uh, but it, it's the Hebrew letter for the Vav when it's inside. The word, it, a lot of times it's a vowel, like the holy name, yud Hey vav Hey. That's like you see, it. you put a vowel to it. So it would be like Shavua. Uh, Shavua Tov, we say when Shabbat's over. You know, have a good week or ahead and have a blessed week. Now, seven verses week. Now, let's look at Genesis chapter 29. It's better sheet 29, 27 here. Here we see Shavua. But we, ha we have week here without the Vav, like I said. And there's other examples in there. And then you see the same exact letters for seven. So you can see that the Shin, the Vav, and the Ayan are interchangeable. Here's we have like another hominid. Right? It could be, this is where, okay, is, is seven, you know, we can translate it as week, we can translate it as seven. And so it, the context really does tell a lot. In most cases it should. And then years, here we have the Hebrew word for years. Shanaim, Shana would be singular, like we say Shana Tova, you know, is a way of saying Happy New Year. But, this is uh, this is just to kind of show you how the yes the word seven and the word weeks is interchangeable. But now what about the word Shabbat? Is that interchangeable? Where's the evidence for that? All right, thank you for your comment, Ryan. Uh, we'll get to those questions a little bit later. That's a good one. Yeah, he calls it his seal. He's it is, uh, like a sign. You know, the, notice that, well, I'll just say this, since we're on it. If you go to Shemot, right, Exodus 31, you see the Sabbath covenant. 
And this is seven chapters. Isn't this interesting? Seven chapters after the Sinai Covenant in Exodus 24. Exodus 24, add 7 to 24, you got Exodus 31. And then we have the Sinai Covenant, as referred to as. And then you get seven chapters later, and then he makes another covenant, but he calls this covenant an Olam Covenant. He doesn't call, go back to 24, it doesn't say Olam Covenant with the Sinai Covenant. This is a covenant between people and the Creator, you know, Israel. And, and so that's not called Olam because yeah, if one party doesn't keep its end of the bargain, it's, it's not going to be Olam. But when our Creator makes a covenant with humanity, often he calls it Olam because he never breaks his covenant. He's not the one to break it. Uh, like the, the Noah Covenant, we call it. Uh, the Noah Covenant, the, the rainbow, he calls that an Olam Covenant. We can count on that. No, oh, well, we don't want that covenant to be abolished. Uh, yeah, I don't want another flood to cover the whole earth. We're getting enough floods in the United States as it is. I'm looking at the the murder and mayhem that happens even when people riot and can't handle natural catastrophes. Can you imagine the whole earth flooding again? Well, I, I sure hope that Olam covenant hasn't been abolished. I don't think it, it needs to be renewed because he's he's going to keep that covenant. So that's a little side note. Okay, anyway, let's get back to the message here. So let me just say, before we continue, beware comparing modern Hebrew to ancient Hebrew. All languages, like I said, change a little over the centuries. right? So the word weak in modern Hebrew is Shavua. They throw the, the Vav in there as a vowel. And we can debate about how it was pronounced 2,000 years ago because it was interchangeable with weak. You can see how I have weak in ancient biblical Hebrew. Uh, that's, I pointed that out earlier. The word seven, you know, both in modern Hebrew as uh, Sheba, or you could say Shavua if you're reading the Torah from a Torah scroll behind the Bema. And there's no vowels in there. So getting back to my diagram, I just add a little bit more to this because here we see that, yes, uh, weeks is interchangeable. And like I said, there's a lot to look at there. You can put pause and freeze and, and check that out. If you want me to copy and paste any URLs in there, like from the, the scripturesforall.org, I can put that in the comments. You can send me an email if you want uh, more correspondence with me in detail. I got I got a day job, so you have to be patient with me sometimes. See, Ryan says, is it important to study Hebrew for us to understand God or for God to understand us? Well, I don't think, uh, I think he understands every language. I don't think he has a problem understanding us. Um, uh, but we can understand the scriptures better just under, we don't have to be experts always, but just the, at least the, some of these basics here. Um, I, I got a good teaching on the stone of Israel, looking at the word stone. You put that together, you have like a father's son, and then the, the chief cornerstone getting rejected by the by the you know the builders of the temple in Isaiah, and uh, the stone of stumbling. And so when you look at stones through the scriptures, it's like saying father and son, singular, father, children. And the stones of the temple, are all, the physical temple, is symbolic of his children. As we understand the, the original language, we can debunk bad theology, serious contradictions. The example I showed you with uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 7, where Christianity says, oh, see, they met on the first of the week and they broke bread. See, the Sabbath was on Sunday. In the first. Well, if you just study the Greek a little bit, doesn't t you don't have to be a Greek expert to, to find out a lot of these things are bad, that a lot of these conclusions that people are coming to out there. Yes, Pat has made a great comment. Translators have been known to put their own meanings to make their modern views through history as authority. Uh, many have done this over the centuries. Yep. Okay. Anyway, notice this next slide here. This is Leviticus getting back to uh, Leviticus 23, 15 through 16 here from the interlinear. 
You can see here, notice as I've color-coded this for you. Here's the word for seven. And then you have the, the seventh, you know, when you put the TH in the translation, there's uh, more suffix letters to it. The yud, you throw in between the the vav and the ayin, and then the tav at the, at the end there, and then there's ha, the at the beginning, so it's the seventh. So we see that seven and week are interchangeable, but what about Sabbath? See, I did it up here in blue. You would think that the translations there, any translations out there, would uh, put it differently other than the Orthodox Judaism and the complete Jewish Bible. But the word Sabbath and week, is that interchangeable as, as claimed? Well, we're going to do a little more investigation more explicit evidence to come. Okay, we're running out of time for today. I will get to some more explicit evidence on when to start counting. Is it the day after a weekly Sabbath or an annual or, or yearly one? When exactly should we begin counting 50 for Shavuot, Pentecost? I have some more explicit information for you, but it's going to have to be to con to continued for another Shabbat. Not necessarily a Shabbaton, but at least a Shabbat. In the meantime, let's get back to this main topic, okay? Uh, I've kind of like gone off on this topic a little bit more. Remember, guys and gals, Mishpacha out there, multiple choice interpretations. Yes, there's multiple choices, many different possible interpretations sometimes. And so beware, I want to throw out there, beware of dogma regarding ambiguous interpretations. Like I said, where do we see the explicit evidence that Shabbat is interchangeable with week? You can go to, like I said, the counting of seven years and for the Shemitah years into the Jubilee, the 50th year, and you can see some logic. And the big question is, okay, 2,000 years ago was Hebrew that way. It's not that way today. Nobody says Shabbat when they're referring to week today, or Shabbos if Shabbos if you're if you're Ashkenazi, you don't use you use Shavua, or or Sheva is seven, Shavua, or Shavuot for plural for weeks, and so as the language to avoid confusion, this is why languages evolve a little bit, they change a little bit because. They try to get rid of this confusion. People get confused. What do you mean by that? Huh? What does he mean by that? Huh? What? So they they realize, okay, we got to stop using these interchangeable. Let's make it a little bit more clear. And but so was it interchangeable 2,000 years ago? That becomes a little more debatable, and and a little more investigation in the scriptures. I'll continue in a, in a future topic on this, but. What I'm talking about, when it comes to ambiguous interpretations also, especially the non-action, the non-commandment ones, the, the non-relationship topics that, that have to do with improving relationship. You know, actions involve relationship, how you treat each other, do we really love each other, and how we treat each other, and do you love others as you love your own self? And if you can love your Creator and others as your own self, then you're fulfilling the whole Torah. That's what all the commandments are, are about. Uh, for example, getting back to this topic, we're, we're coming down, winding down, as, as Shaul, uh, most people know him as Paul, also warned in, in his epistles here. He says, Receive one another who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful. Now, doubtful things are things that are ambiguous, topics that are a little more ambiguous, not so explicit, don't have quite enough evidence in the scriptures themselves. We've got to, this is where we say, okay, we can agree to differ, or maybe we just don't understand the scriptures well enough, and as we do, we'll, we'll, we'll agree later on. But we've got to be careful not to debate and, and to cause division over doubtful ambiguous things. What does ambiguous mean? Uh, this is the online dictionary definition. For open more, to more than one interpretation. Okay, like I said, we're talking about homonyms, homophones, homographs. We're talking about different grammar issues, suffixes, uh, having a doubtful, a double meaning. 
Okay, sometimes there's duality or double meanings to scripture, especially when things are prophetic and metaphoric and allegoric, and and people want to argue about the nature of this and the nature of him and who and what. Okay, well, uh, verse two here he says unclear, or actually this is the second definition of ambiguous, unclear or inexact because a choice between alternatives has not been made. Okay. Well, if you haven't made, if it's not clear enough, well, you don't have to just force a conclusion and then embarrass yourself later on if you're wrong. It's, it's good to remain humble, especially on ambiguous topics. And just, oh, this is my take on it. This is my opinion. I love you, brother, sister, out there, mishpacha, family. And notice what he says in Titus chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. He says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have, been, who have believed in Yah, the Most High, should be careful to maintain good works. Like I said, is it action-based? How does it affect our actions or our works or our fruits? Continuing in the verse, it says, these things are good and profitable to men. And another thing is that it's women too. Both Greek and Hebrew, like those uh, Romance languages, Eastern European and European languages are masculine and feminine. So when you're talking to men and women, you, you choose the masculine. So, uh, you know, since we're talking about Hebrew and Greek and don't want any women out there to get offended, this is talking about you too. Uh, we're not excluding women here, and I don't think Paul is either in this regard. But verse 9, he says, But avoid foolish disputes, or as I put in here, not bearing good fruit, genealogies. I know oh, my ancestry is this. I'm a Cohen. I, uh, I've got, I got my DNA tested by um, genealogy.com or whatever it is. I'm part of this master race. Uh, I got the right skin color for Israel. Uh, you've probably seen uh, certain uh, racial supremacy doctrines out there. And so Paul says, don't argue and debate over these things. Okay, was, was Yeshua, was he black, brown, yellow, uh, white? Uh, maybe he was the Incredible Hulk and green. Uh, well, I don't think he was green, but... And I don't think he's an incredible Hulk. I, you know, please don't take me for blasphemy there. Like I said, I get a little sarcastic. But people get too dogmatic and, and fight and cause divisions. And people have commented on my YouTube teaching and say, You blank idiomite, you're going down in the end times. And I was like, oh, whoa. What kind of fruits of the Spirit is that on my YouTube comments? So far, I'm getting some respectful comments today. Thank you very much. No derogatory terminologies and uh, so forth. But they are unprofitable, as Shaul says. Unprofitable and useless. Oh, I jumped ahead here. He says, contentions. So avoid genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law. Okay, what law is he talking about? Okay, this is where it says, if he's talking about the written Torah, that means we can just do what we want. Everyone does this right in their own eyes and you can't be your brother's keeper anymore. Is that what he's saying? Or is he talking about interpretations of the law? People are arguing, debating about halakha, oral law. This is what Moshe really meant. This is what how you really keep the Sabbath. And, and so we can have some different standards a little bit here and there, but is, is it really in the word there, in the strivings to, to try to keep it? And this is where he's talking about people are becoming unprofitable and useless. And even if I've realized sometimes if I believe I'm right and someone just can't see it the same way I do, I don't want them to hate me. I don't want to create, let's just move on to another topic and let's, we can focus on things we agree on. And, and sometimes we've got to draw lines when it comes to division, if it's heinous and really bad enough and a serious thing, but he's talking about, in this context, about ambiguous things, difficult things, uh, things that are not cut and dry. Or verse 10, reject a divisive person or man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning and self-condemned. So that's just a little warning out there. 
I'd like to conclude. There are some ambiguous topics. Like I said, non-action based. I'll give you some examples here. So how about, here's an ambiguous topic for you. How old is the Earth and universe? Is it 6,000 years old? Is that when everything in matter itself and physical matter, three-dimensional universe was created 6,000 years ago with the creation week versus millions or billions of years? And I've seen a lot of debates and arguments and unfortunately division and bitterness against people who can't agree on that. But it's, like I said, it, it, it's not action-based. It's, it's, it's like knowledge, yes. Knowledge can be good. But how does it affect your character, how you treat, how do you worship, when you worship, who you worship? Well, did ancient Israel and Yeshua, a.k.a. Jesus, out there for those of you Christians, did he have white, brown, or black skin color? Well, like I say, well, can't anybody be grafted in when people start calling me idiomite? And I'm going down and I'm going to be their slave someday. I just say, well, can I graft in? And if not, can I be your top slave? I said that to one of them. And then he laughed and I think he got the point. Anyway, we got to have the fruits to the spirit of, of that are better than that. Is uh, Big Brother watching us? All right, here's another thing, conspiracy theories and rumors. And, and I've seen people, and I'm not pointing the finger at anybody out there, but in the past, especially uh, in some of the congregations I've been, where people, that's like their whole religion is focusing on what the government's doing and the cameras and the black helicopters and the concentration camps and and uh, what Trump is doing, what Obama's doing, what well, Reagan was doing and Bush and all of it. You know, t to me, okay, well... I covered Isaiah chapter 8 last week about uh, warning of fearing conspiracies and governments having problems. There's always going to be overthrows and assassination attempts and, and corrupt people in the governments that might be after us. But fear Yah, the Most High. He's the one to fear, not any of them. Don't fear what anyone can do to your body, but fear the one who can, who can take your soul for eternity, as another scripture says in uh, in uh, Matthew's Yahoo. Oh, how about the Earth? Is it flat? Is it a globe? Is it a cube? Well, no, maybe it's a pyramid. Well, okay. Either way, how does it affect our actions? How does it affect how we relate to this world? How? Where is this that we should be preaching and teaching and and proving our credibility of Torah observance? By these things, and and like I said, it's just uh, I don't want to cause division or, or hate with people who disagree with me on these things. These, like I said, these are ambiguous topics that Shaul even warned. Those these are the type of ones he would be talking about if he was here speaking in my place right now. I think. Now, what are the fruits? Like I said, of such doctrines that do not affect actions of obedience, worship, love. You know, those two great commandments, right? The Torah and the prophets. Can these topics be more of distractions? Time away from learning the Torah. Maybe learning some Hebrew, learning some Greek a little bit better. Learning some of these topics that do affect actions and decisions and how we worship, who we worship, when we worship, who we gather to worship with. Do we want to cause unnecessary divisions and loss of credibility with others? For issues that should require repentance, uh, you know, some people say, "Why major in the minors? I'd rather major in, in the most important things." But you know, I'm not saying the little things aren't important, especially when it comes to commandments and action base. So, how important is each topic? You know, topic by topic, evaluate based upon these things, and some things are more important. As as a reminder, very. Uh, preaching to the choir uh, scripture here to those who are walking in Torah, who's, who come to embrace the written Torah and the, and the Sabbath and the feast. But as a reminder, I, I have a lot of Christians coming in and, and learning as well. Here, uh, as uh, as it says here in Matthew, Yahoo, in Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40, it says, And one of them was a Torah expert. This is a complete Jewish Bible. I like this translation better in this one because it'll say lawyer uh, in some translations, which is it's more of like someone who's in the law, in, in Yah's law, not just 
uh, some Greek uh, Roman Empire lawyer or American United States lawyer in this country. Anyway, a Torah expert asked Mashila, and that's Sheila if you're down under in Australia, it's, it's not talking about a woman, okay? This is where we got to understand culture, it's not just uh, wording here, right? <laughs> like I said earlier. And they're trying to trap him, right? He said, Rabbi, which of the mitzvot, the commandments in the Torah is most important? And he told him, you are to love yud heh vav -Hey, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. This is the Shema, right? We say Shema Israel. And, and uh, Hero Israel. This is the greatest and the most important mitzvah, a commandment. That's the singular for commandment. And the second is similar to it. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. How do we like to be treated when people disagree with us? Do we like to be respected? Do we like derogatory terminology thrown at us like mud? I don't want to get into a slinging mud fight with anybody or word fight either. Verse 40. All the Torah and the prophets depend upon these two mitzvot, the commandments. They all teach us, like a tutor, like a schoolmaster, showing us where we're falling short, where we need to improve, where we can, like I said, action-based, uh, action that involves actions of love and, and relationship with one another, with our maker and each other. A fellow humanity. No, and then also the the love chapter. This is very common. Everybody knows this, right? Especially in Christianity. But if you're in Judaism out there and you haven't read the New Testament a whole lot, uh, yes, he said, I may have the gift of prophecy. I may fathom all mysteries and know all things and, and have all faith. Yeah, I could even be moving mountains. And, and But if I lack love, what is that agape love? I am nothing. Uh, nothing of any value. So it's always a good remember, reminder when you get into uh, debates and disagreements and trying to understand the different ways to interpret this, uh, the multiple choice interpretations. When there's a number of different ways to interpret the same Hebrew or Greek words, or even English for that matter. Now, how about the little Torah commandments? Am I trying to put them down? Am I saying that the little commandments, like I mentioned earlier, when I said little things, I don't major in the minors. Well, here we go here. As it says in Matthew 5.17, another common scripture to most of us, is do not think that I've come to abolish the Torah. If any Christians out there listening to this, and especially if they've made it this far, whew, thank you so much. But he says here, don't think that I came to abolish it or the prophets. No, no, nothing in the Tanakh is what he's saying in the Old Testament, a.k.a. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill. That Greek word is pleru'u. He came to pleru'u them. Okay, does that mean he fulfill Torah and do it all for us? All done at the cross, they say, and way back then. We don't, we don't have to do it. So we don't have to obey Torah anymore is, is, is the conclusion that mainstream Christianity has been pushing for centuries. Uh, at least 500, you know, since the, uh, that old uh, saved by faith alone without any need for obedience. Regardless of what James chapter 2, 24 says, in, in the verses before that as well. Okay, notice this here. Why are we told to bear his cross? If he finished it all for us, if it was all done, why did he say to bear his cross? He said, you won't even be my disciple if you can't bear my cross. And when it comes down to it, when you have to do it, you, if you want to be a, a faithful disciple. And then Shaul says, we've got to be living sacrifices. Now, I'm not saying we need to be dead sacrifices or go out there and try to get persecuted, but to be living sacrifice, to sacrifice time, energy, effort to help others, not just about ourselves or saving our own skins. And it says fulfill, 
baptism, same Greek word. If you go back to John chapter 3, verse 15, you can read it for yourself, but it's the same Greek word that he says fulfill in, in chapter 5, verse 17. Just two chapters earlier, he says, we, I need to be baptized. Yochanan, the immerser, you know, John the Baptist said, you don't need to be baptized, right? He had this ruach from birth. He didn't have a sin to repent of. Why be baptized? If anyone had the right to say, no, I don't need to. I don't have to do it. It would be him. And he said, no, you need to do it because we need to fulfill. We need to play a ru'u. All righteousness. Well, getting back to Matthew chapter 5 here, it says, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments, this is talking about Torah, the written Torah, and teaches others according will be called least. Now, the first least is a good thing. We want to, yeah, do and teach those, but we don't want to be called least in the kingdom purposely. I mean, just to be there will be good enough, right? But we don't want to just settle for less. But whoever practices and teaches these commandments will be called great. Great in the kingdom of heaven. Why would he say that if, if he did it all so we don't have to? So I, I cannot say for any of you out there, but let me say I want to be great in his kingdom so I can more greatly help and serve others. It's not just about myself or my vanity or, hey, everybody look at me, I'm, I'm so great. But I want to help others. Wouldn't it be great if you could just go and do more for other people and just go into a hospital and heal everybody or go to Africa and help all the homeless. I mean, the more greatness and powers we have, of course, we always have to follow his will and his timing on everything. That's why we do need to submit. He doesn't want a bunch of rebels out there. I mean, if if he were to give those kind of powers that he has to to humanity without obedience, well, just watch a, a superhero movie or Avengers and you'll see what humanity is like when they get too much power. It's, it's chaos and Star Wars and and uh, well, going to places where no man should ever go before or in the future and as well. Nevertheless, you know, I want to I want to be like more like the Most High. Doesn't everybody want to be more like Him? Well, these are His words and His commandments. You know, it's not Moses didn't make them up. It's not His His commandments. I want to be more like him. It's like a window into his character. It's his words, not mine. I just need to understand them more accurately or how to apply them, the intent of them. In closer relationship. Don't you want to be in closer relationship with him? I do. And, um, you know, so I believe that he fulfilled the Torah and baptism so we can too. Not so we don't have to, but so we can too with the same helper, with the same spirit, why underestimate? With power. humanity, such is impossible. But with him, all things are possible. In Yeshua.